Well, let's get started. Uh, thanks for coming. Good to see you all here. Recent decades have seen the rise from poverty of hundreds of millions of people. It's really remarkable, a great success story. It's not only changed the lives and life trajectories of so many, it's been accompanied by rising life expectancy, dropping infant mortality, and steadily more people living with governments chosen by voters. All of those things, in turn, fuel yet more aspiration. But there's so much further we have to go. To get millions who are poor out of poverty, and millions who are extremely poor to be less so, the world has tried a lot of approaches. Massive projects funded by faraway donors, government-to-government -government aid, not-for-profit-to-government aid, gigantism and micro-enterprise. In the 80s, I was in one of the poorest places in sub-Saharan Africa and happened to visit two projects on the same day, both funded by international donors. One was an asparagus farm and canning plant, the other a fish pond built by local people. The asparagus canning was supported by Dutch and German NGOs. The cans were imported, the canning machinery was imported, the asparagus themselves grown from imported rootstock. What the local people working in the plant got was a salary, and that was good because they hadn't had one before. But for the foreseeable future, each can of asparagus heading to faraway European markets was going to do so at a loss. A couple of hours drive away, the women of a large village were installing a series of fish ponds in a well-watered part of the country. The labor was local. There was only one outside advisor helping to get the project up to commercial scale. And in a year or two, there would be a self-sustaining business providing a steady supply of protein for local diets and steady profit from sales to neighboring villages that were not as blessed with a water supply. And the profits would be shared by the women who put in the sweat equity to build the ponds and would own the ponds after they were completed. At work were very different ideas about transferable skill, profit, and accountability. Today we're going to talk about the role of business in reducing poverty with people immersed in the work from various kinds of stakeholders to try to give you a wider view of the best thinking in this area. We've got representatives from the private foundation sector, a giant multinational, a giant government, and a structures expert who wants to help business people in high poverty areas organize and protect what they build. They are C.D. Glynn, President and CEO of the U.S. African Development Foundation, Cherie Blair of the Cherie Blair Foundation for Women, Charlotte Odes, Global Vice President for Women's Economic Development at the Coca-Cola Company, and Bart Houlihan, co-founder of B-Lab Company. I'd like to just start with a quick run across the panel to give our audience an idea of what your organization does and how its design reflects your thinking about using business as a catalyst to do poverty alleviation. CD, let's start with you. Great, thanks, thanks Ray. So the U.S. African Development Foundation was established about 20 years after USAID. So I'm sure everybody in this room knows the United States Agency for International Development, and very few people in this room probably know what the U.S. African Development Foundation is. And the reason why we were established was really to be a counter to big development from a big donor country. We focus on grassroots enterprise development that really increases economic opportunities, economic growth for localized lives using local enterprise. And how do we do that? I like, to, I like to frame it from our name. Our name is very, very easy. The U.S., the U.S. government, African Development Foundation. That A, it does stand for African, but also be about, about being African-led. So all of our management, all of our operations in 20 plus countries are led by na African nationals, led by local community members. So we don't have any contractors, we don't have any expats. We are really African-led in our model. We're agile and adaptable because all of our grant making, and this is seed capital linked with technical assistance, is designed from the bottom up. It's designed by the people in the local communities, and we, using the D, are demand driven. We're demand responsive to their needs, to the opportunities that they bring, and really meet them where, where they are. We bring the seed capital, we bring technical assistance, but they bring the what. 
what is the need of that community? How do we really advance ourselves out of po poverty? And we look in three specific areas, agriculture, off-grid energy, and youth-led enterprise. Now, the last thing, sorry, you, the agility is there, a speedboat in the, in the ocean liners of foreign assistant. We're this speedboat, if you will. $30 million a year, directly implemented in countries, directly funding local grassroots cooperatives and organizational, organ, organizations. But I like to think about the foundation aspect of really being about first mile. So we're all here at school, and we think about last mile development. Well, why do we think about last mile? Why well, think about it? Because I was a Peace Corps volunteer, and I went from Washington, D.C. to the far reaches in, in Southern Africa, where the paved road ended, my job began, because I was going there. And we think about last mile because we're distributing something to people. Well, at USADF, we talk about first mile, because the first point of contact, the first phase of funding, the first step of really looking at local economic growth is in that community. So we're not bringing something to them, we're taking something from out of them and expanding it and growing it and making it more prosperous and putting them on a pathway to prosperity. So we really talk about being African-led, being demand-driven, and being first mile focused and using taxpayer dollars to catalyze that change in those local communities. Thanks, C.D. Cherie Blair? Well, at the Cherie Blair Foundation, we believe that if we empower women so that they can have their own money and they, then they can make their own choices. And so we work with women entrepreneurs, small and medium-sized business people who uh, want to grow and expand their businesses. And we do that by doing what we say is looking at the three C's. We believe that a, a woman entrepreneur needs three things. She needs confidence. And I don't need to tell you all here that so many parts of the world, including even in this country, women are often told what they can't do rather than what they can do. And so confidence is a really important part of that. So our programs always help with women's confidence. We then look at the women's capacity. So we do a huge amount of business training, financial literacy training to help women get those skills which are not necessarily naturally required. Many of the women we work to do have natural talent, whether it's in uh, the fashion industry or in science and technology or engineering, but they, or medicine even, but they don't necessarily have the business skills. It's one thing to know how to, how to uh, deliver a service, and it's another thing to know how to read a balance sheet. And so we do a lot of of business skills training, that's our second C. And our third C, and, and the most difficult one to crack, is access to capital. Mm -hmm. Because we live in a world where if you want $10, then there are, these days microfinancing is gonna find a solution mm -hmm. for you. And if you want 10 million or more, then venture capital will probably find a solution for you. If you want 25, 50, even 100,000 to grow and expand your business, which is probably already employing 10, 15 people, but you want to take it to the next level, very difficult to get that capital. And so uh, we are constantly devising and looking for ways to help our women entrepreneurs raise capital. And um, because we believe that if you're talking about development, then you're talking about empowering women to drive the expansion of their businesses. So they're not only employing their own families and helping their own families, but they really are providing job opportunities for men and women, boys and girls in their communities. And we have three different ways of doing that, three programs, because our programs are driven by technology. Because in the 21st century, technology can help us reach people we haven't been able to reach before, give them access to information that's been inaccessible to them before, and to link people across the world uh, to make transactions, to help each other, to loan money to each other. So that's what we do. So our first program is our global mentoring platform. And this is a platform where we reach out to women who are having businesses and employing people. They have to have access to the internet, which in many parts of the world, of course, is, is, can be difficult. And they have to be able to speak English. So we're not talking about bottom of the pyramid women here. We're talking about women with enterprises. Mm. Um, and we match these women with men and women mentors all over the world. So to date, we're in over 100 countries. 
because we partner with local NGOs who are doing business training and we offer them this service, an add-on service, which is a year's mentoring uh, whereby the woman is given a mentor who for two hours a month will help them on their business journey with a specific plan. And we have built a worldwide community there which not only is a dating service, is actually uh, a community which uh, talks with each other and works and supports each other. Then our next program is what we call our enterprise development programs. And this is much more face-to-face, um, -face, on the ground, business training, financial literacy training, which we do in different geographies. And in that program, we've developed our blended learning approach, which again, uses technology to enable women entrepreneurs to be able to get the sort of access to the business skills training they need without having to give up huge chunks of time away from their business. And we found that that's been very, very uh, successful because women like that flexibility that a combination of some face-to-face -face training and a lot of other training delivered um, mm -hmm. over uh, technology really works. And then our third program is our mobile phone program, which is aimed much more at towards the bottom of the pyramid, women providing basic skills, training and information uh, to help women by using the mobile phone, either to learn business skills, uh, possibly to develop a small business around selling uh, mobile phone time or mobile money services. And finally, we've developed a number of apps which just make life easier for, for, for <coughs> women who have got small businesses by using the mobile phone to uh, give them the advantage of technology. Um, so that's what we do. Charlotte? Um, good morning. Um, I lead the, uh, what we call 5 by 20 initiative at Coca-Cola, um, which is our women's economic empowerment initiative. Um, we made a global commitment to enable the economic empowerment of 5 million women entrepreneurs across our global value chain by 2020. And this was a commitment we made um, at the end of 2010. Um, so as you think about um, Coca-Cola company, um, it's obviously very well known for its global brands and it's a global company, but actually the way we operate is a very, very local business. So as, as we look at that, we want to hire people locally, we all live and work in the local community, so it's really, really important to us that the community is thriving, it's sustainable, uh, and that's critical for obviously us as a business to grow, and so the two go hand in hand. So we see women as being absolutely critical to that. Women are not only the pillars of um, the local community, but we all know that if you can, as Cherie has said, if you can enable a woman to actually earn her own livelihood, have her own business, then the ripple effect of that is enormous on the community. And it's not just the woman who benefits, but it's her family, her children then are able to go to school because she invests in them, she spends in the local economy. So there's this massive ripple effect, and obviously that's good for, for businesses to then operate in that community. So that's the reason we believe this is so important. Um, and as from a business perspective, um, the, the critical thing, I think, for, from my perspective is that it is looking across those small businesses that we would have the opportunity to touch. And that might not be a business yet. It might be helping women to set up businesses from scratch, or it may be helping her to grow one that she already has. And we look at it right across what we would call our, our value chain. So it starts with smallholder farmers that might be growing fruit or any kind of crop that we might be able to take into our beverages at some point. It could be any kind of supplier. It could be a distributor. Um, in Africa, we have committed to say 50% of all new distributors must be women. Um, we look at s small neighborhood stores, you know, the small businesses which are very popular for women to set up because it's close to home, um, it's not in an area that's unsafe for them to go into, um, and they sell things in the local community. Um, we also look at recycling businesses and waste picking businesses, um, and we also look at um, artisan businesses that make things from recycled beverage packaging, often combining them with indigenous materials. So many different kinds. And because we are um, so global but so local, um, we do work very much at the bottom of the pyramid. Um, and I believe that linking it to the business 
um, so that we can help those businesses grow is actually the way to make it truly sustainable. And Charlotte, you're actually wearing one of your artisans. I am. Yeah, this is made from recycled uh, plastic bottles um, from the Amazon, from one of our artisans in the Amazon. What? Yeah. Thank you. Good morning. Um, so B Lab's a nonprofit. We're trying to directly address the question of this panel. How do we get business more engaged in alleviating poverty, addressing inequality, addressing climate change? Our approach is pretty straightforward. Uh, we're trying to redefine success in business. We believe in a generation's time, there needs to be a different way we all think about what success means. Uh, it's gonna need to require companies not just being best in the world, but best for the world. Mm. To get there, there's gonna need to be some infrastructure put in place. Uh, the first is we need new metrics, right? As we think about business, it needs to not just be about financial accomplishments, it needs to include community engagement, worker involvement, and environmental footprint. Those need to be included in what we think about as a successful business. Secondly, the truth is if we want different outcomes from business, we gotta change the rules. And that means we need to address shareholder primacy. And so for us, that means a new legal framework that requires companies to create not only value for their shareholders, but also for society and the environment. And then third and finally, we have to address transparency. Companies need to be transparent, not just about their financial results, but also about their social and environmental impact. Our theory of change, again, pretty straightforward. We find leaders, best in class companies. We give them an identity. We call them certified B corporations. I'm sure almost everybody here is familiar with fair trade. Fair trade is to coffee what certified B Corp is to a good business. Okay, really simply. To be certified, you gotta demonstrate the highest standards of social and environmental performance as evidenced through something called our B Impact Assessment. Secondly, you gotta embed in the actual governance of the company a commitment to stakeholders so it's in the DNA of the business. And then third and finally, you need to be transparent with your results. We have about 2,100 certified B corporations in 54 different countries, over 150 different industries, commonality. They're all using business as a force for good. Our objective after identifying these leaders is then to provide easy tools for others to follow. So the impact assessment we use for the certification, it's free, it's a public good, anybody can use it. It includes case studies, best practice guidelines, et cetera. We have about 60,000 companies using that tool as an internal management tool to try to be more impactful. The second scaling tool for us, allowing companies to follow the lead of the community is a new legal framework. It, it's literally a new legal um, type of corporation. It's called a benefit core. Okay, we, we have passed now in 32 states in the United States and about six months ago in Italy, there are eight countries that are considering it currently. It was recommended by the G7 for all countries to adopt this new legal entity. So think traditional corporation, think nonprofit, and then sitting next to it, something called a benefit core that requires a company to create shareholder value and social value simultaneously. Those two pieces work together to try to allow companies to follow the lead of the community as certified B Corps, the long-term objective, as I said, is to redefine success in business so that we're getting a shared and durable prosperity through the business community. Now you know what our panelists do. I'm interested in what was learned along the way. Not stories of failure, but stories of adaptation. Plans are, I mean, smart people make plans. And then they go in and like war plans, they, so, they sometimes don't survive the first shot. There are things that you have to change, modify, um, reshape to local conditions. I'm wondering if in all your cases, there have been times where something that looked great on paper needed to be adapted uh, because of things that you just don't know until you're actually doing it. You know, I, I'll start. One of the things just in, I think in the philanthropic space and looking at grant funding, because you make a grant, therefore you are good. And that sort of that, we, we have money and we make grants to poor and vulnerable people in hard to reach underserved communities in, in the Horn of Africa, in the Sahel, in the Great Lakes, Great Lakes region. So we make a grant to an organization, we link them with technical assistance and therefore we've done good, good in the world. 
And one of the things coming, coming into, into this role is we had to do some critical analysis about what are we really trying to do? Are we trying to make grants? Or are we trying to make change? And if we're trying to make change, we need to be intentional in a very different way. And so we started structuring our grant making around the f a first phase of funding, a phased approach. Really, again, that first mile, that first phase of funding, your operational assistance and taking a cooperative, an agricultural cooperative and saying your, your governance structure, your, your books in order, your financial management tool, some operational assistance. And then there's a next phase of funding and really about enterprise expansion. And for years, we sort of did operational assistance, we did enterprise expansion and we would stop. So then I come along and I start saying, this is great, what do we have in this, in this agency? We have 500 community enterprises, social enterprises throughout, throughout Africa, and tough places, Mali, Niger, Burkina Faso, uh, Somalia, DRC, I mean, really tough places. And, and we're doing this grants and we're doing operational assistance, we're doing enterprise expansion. And I said, great, 500, 60 million invested in them. Just great grant. Where are the winners? Who are the ones that are really linking to follow on funding, linking to others? And it was like this room, it was crickets. Oh, they have to go somewhere? <laughs> I said, we have a tagline that says, creating pathways to prosperity. What's the pathway? And we had to, Ray, get smarter around saying, you know, we're almost, we're an educational institution, so let's say it like this. We help them do high school. And we even get them to college. But every college is predicate, predicates its success on where their graduates go and how much money they make. So where did our grantees, these early stage investees, these agricultural off-grid energy, youth-led enterprises, where did they go after we stopped? And we didn't have answers for that. So we had to think about really adapting our model and saying we probably need to find out what Cherie Blair Foundation, what um, Coca-Cola and others are looking for. So when we leave, when we stop our, fu our funding and go and find and let another thousand flowers bloom that we're linking together. So we had to create a new sort of level to really think about a real continuum. And it was sort of a eureka moment because it was like, you know, we were making grants. We feel really good about our, ourselves. We can say in volume how many grants we're making. And we even look at revenue generation, but we didn't really think about these uh, the most organizations that have a, a, a pathway, a continuum to really keep in, increasing. And that was, again, it was a moment in time where we said, it's not, it's about what we do, but it's about what happens after we stop doing. And that's really one, one way that we had to adapt. Who's next? Can we just that's go down right. the line? I mean, <laughs> um, I'm very interested in what you said because before I started the foundation, for 10 years in Downing Street, I'd done, every week I did a, uh, charitable reception and saw loads of charities both nationally and internationally and it did strike me sometimes that there was a lot of duplication going on and sometimes just a lot of things continuing because that's just what we've always done and so when I set up the foundation I was very clear that we needed to make sure that everything we did there was a reason for it and at the end that we always worked out did it actually work because if it doesn't work you should stop doing it and try and do something else. And so with all our programs, uh, we've, we've just, uh, last year we, we did an analysis of our mentoring program and we got independent Tassibrook associate, Associates to assess whether actually remote mentoring really works. Fortunately, they gave us the, the thumbs up, so that, that was good. Um, with our um, mobile phone programs, uh, we did, a, we did a, this business women's app where we reached over 70,000 women in uh, Nigeria and 100,000 women overall in Tanzania, Nigeria and Indonesia. You know, but again, does it make any difference sending a woman a text message as we were doing four text messages a week and helping her with business hints and tips? So we got uh, the Michigan State University to do a, an analysis of that. And they, they found, first of all, it did make a difference. But secondly, that there was a huge desire for us to provide them with further services. So yes, it's good to have information delivered where you are so that you can look at it at the time. It was amazing how many of those women then shared it with others. But they really wanted some more interconnectivity uh, so that they could ask more questions rather than just being told things. So we've moved on to our phase two now that we're doing, and we're doing that in Mexico, and that's called She Ventures. And She Ventures is now moving from um, 2G mobile phone text messaging onto a web-based service, which is more widely available. 
and which will enable us, you know, sometimes even to do little videos or uh, allow much more interchange uh, between the people who are, who, who are using the platform. So again, our ideas have developed because of, because of this. Our blended learning program that we're doing at the moment, we've done with, thanks to ExxonMobil in, um, in Nigeria and, and, and another program we've done in Malaysia with the help of Qualcomm where we gave small tablet computers to groups of women um, entrepreneurs there and free access to the internet and they came onto our mentoring program. We've had them independently assess to see, well, does it work? What can we do better? But in a small, just, just as a, a, a small example, in our enterprise development program, we've developed this business skills training for women, which we, we, we did in Palestine, and we were doing in, in parts of the Lebanon. And then, then we moved up to the Bekaa Valley. You know, we got our local partner, started delivering. And of course, in the Bekaa Valley, there's huge issues with what's going on in Syria and, and you know, we found that working with the women there, when you're talking about business training, when you're talking about developing business planning, you have to be able to think about what's going to happen, not just next week, but next month and next year. Working with these women, where they're, 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 they're in such a precarious, fragile community, they could barely think about what was going to happen tomorrow. And so we had to really change the way we worked our program to, to be able to help these women start to begin to believe that they could think a little bit more than just what was going to happen in the next 24 hours. So that was a, that was a learning experience. Another example, um, I said we, with our mobile phones, we, we, we did this whole work with mobile phone companies and banks. Uh, we did it in three countries in particular. And what we were doing is we were giving business training to women and at the end they were given by the mobile phone company a contract to enable them to sell them become mobile money agents and i don't need to explain to you i hope what happens with the mobile money um, but to do that you have to first buy your block of mobile phone time and so we entered into deals with local banks um, to allow the women, when, when they've been trained, to go and get credit from the banks. It worked really well in two geographies, but in one country in Africa, we had abysmal success, well, not abysmal, but, you know, the, the rates of take-up. Uh, so we train all these women, but, you know, less than 30% of them were actually getting the loans mm -hmm. that the bank had promised. And we realised that you have to, it's not enough to have the... The local bank, the, the CEO and, the, and the, the board say, oh, yes, we're going, to, we're going to commit to this. Because what was happening is whatever they were saying up in head office, at local level, the mainly male finance officers just couldn't get their head round the idea that giving any loan at all to a woman uh, was anything other than a big risk. Mm -hmm. um, so that taught us that, you know, Ever since then, you know, it's not just when we do enter into a, a, an agreement with a banks like this, we have to also make sure that the bank is actually going to transmit this message down to the, the people who are delivering the service. You know, and that, that's about making sure that people have incentives, that, that, that they are judged on how many, how many loans they give to women, that they're trained in why women actually are a good risk, better risk than men in many cases. So all the time, you, you are learning and you have to adapt because that's just the way of, of, of life. We're all learning every day, aren't we? Mm -hmm. That's true. Um, I think I think the one thing I've learned is to be a bit more patient. <laughs> um, I think when you um, when you come from the business side, you expect to get fast results, and you want to get fast results because you want to meet, reach many, many more people. Uh, and I think I've learned that you you really need. I mean, obviously, we do not do this on our own. You have to have absolutely the right partners um, around the table to really make sure that what you collectively want to achieve, A, can be done, and that you each bring your unique skills to the table to be able to affect that change. Um, we've been, um, I mean, one example I think is, you know, of a learning that we've had that has been 
scalable. Because I came into this thinking we could always design everything for scale. Because that's the background I come from. And I believe that we could make a huge difference to do that. And I think in many instances, we've been successful in doing that and starting to design by scale right from the beginning. And in others, you hit major roadblocks and you find that actually what has worked in one country just does not translate. However, however strong the framework might be, there's either cultural complexities uh, or there are operational issues on the ground or just education is different or habits are different. Something has shifted. Um, I think the things that have been, that I've learned have really worked uh, where, for example, we've worked, um, we worked in Kenya and Uganda um, with uh, TechnoServe um, and with um, uh, the Gates Foundation to actually um, train um, over 50,000 fruit farmers, mango farmers and passion fruit farmers, but particularly mango farmers, to actually learn how to get better yields from their mango trees. We were looking for, obviously, we wanted a local source of quality supply uh, to be able to use in our juice drinks, but also help create broader market access for those mango farmers. And we really wanted them to significantly increase their income. Um, we were successful, collectively, in actually uh, their, their income increased 140%. Um, we were able to source those juices locally and actually produce local brands from that. Minute Maid Mango Juice um, was launched in Kenya. Um, and that model and what we learned through that has then informed projects in other places. We now have a major project in India uh, working with the Jain Corporation um, on mango fruit farming to help really make sure we've got strong quality local supply, but equally those small farmers are learning from that. And we have trained men and women farmers, um, but we always make sure that there's a very strong percentage of women farmers as part of that program. And I think, you know, similar to, to Cherie's experience on, on technology, I mean, what we seek to do always is either provide business building skills for their particular business, um, also access to finance, and also access to mentors and peer networks. It's sometimes one of those things, or it can be all of those things. Um, one of the things we've done recently, um, also in Indonesia, is we, we took what we had designed for scale, which was taking all of the knowledge from um, training small retail businesses into a modularized approach of 13 modules. And we, we tried to take it down to bite-sized chunks for mobile technology. Um, we worked with um, the, the GSMA to look at what the different technological penetration was in different markets. And we, we knew that it was low for, um, for apps in somewhere like Indonesia, because they're still working off uh, SMS, as you said. Um, so we went in thinking it was about 35% penetration, but actually it was much lower. It was more like about 19%. So you have to adapt all the time. And we're also working now with Malaysia, which obviously um, they, they need a completely different application because they have very high smartphone. So how you adapt the content to be relevant and to reach women who are wanting to be, um, they're wanting the, the technology and but they're most important, they're wanting to have their capacity built to actually get that learning in a way that's safe, is easy for them to understand and enables them to be successful. So you're adapting constantly with your partners along the way. Well, picking up on a, a similar theme, so we're trying to build a global movement of people using business as a force for good. Very quickly, we learned that local context is everything. That if we're truly going to try to drive uh, a new way of doing business, we have to make sure that it doesn't or isn't perceived as an American export. Dead in the water, literally dead in the water. And what that means is we got to work with uh, local nonprofits on the ground in each of our markets who are driving this movement. And so we partner with sister nonprofits, System at Bay in Latin America, B Lab UK, B Lab Europe, B Lab East Africa, all of whom understand local context, are staffed with local people, and we, we talk about this as a global movement with local execution. That also then applies down to our standards, right? We're, we're a standards organization, but we need to make sure the standards fit that context. 
that's incredibly challenging, right? We're already trying to measure the impact of a company on all of its stakeholders, governance, consumers, community, environment, consumers. What it means currently is we have 72 different versions of our assessment, depending upon how big you are, where you're located, and what your industry is. So that was one major learning. The second major learning, if, if you're trying to move business to a higher plane, to a higher use, you have to recognize that even if you have the business leader or the entrepreneur on board, even if you have the, uh, the asset owners, meaning the people who actually own the stock, and even consumers and workers, everybody's on board, there's these intermediaries that are in the center. And the intermediaries are incredibly difficult to move. Think attorneys, think investment managers, think bankers. And this is, I'm not being um, you're being pejorative. Mean. You're being mean about lawyers. I'm not being you're pejorative. I honestly, I'm not. <laughs> but almost every one of those intermediaries exists to mitigate risk. Right. right? That is their business. And if we don't massively change and educate attorneys, bankers, investors on the need for business to get more engaged in this, this problem, it will deeply impact the acceleration of this movement. Yeah. It's just critical. To totally, I, I totally agree as, as a lawyer myself and someone I'm just thinking, I wonder if I can make my law firm a B Corp. Um, you can. Well, even, 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 that we're only, even, even when we're only an LLP. You can. Uh, <laughs> we'll talk later. But, but you know, I really, I really think we have to change lawyers from being perceived as the people who tell you what you can't do yeah. into people who tell you how you can do what it is you want to do. And that totally. is really, really in, important that we, we use that imagination and skill of the lawyer in a, in a, in a positive, enabling way. So, you know, I'm, I'm actually... All in, all in favor of that. <laughs> well, I will try to avoid um, using lawyers as a stand-in for the word no, but at the same time, aren't there rigidities that, and, and that have to do with the receiving country, that have to do with already existing codes? Uh, some of the things that we've been talking about involve a sort of hybridized approach uh, to doing business. Uh, in the case of a, a not-for-profit foundation supporting for-profit businesses, a government uh, trying to uh, move things along in the development of businesses. You're involving uh, different sectors that often, for tax reasons, for incorporation reasons, don't necessarily mesh easily. And if you're talking about doing it in more than one place where legal codes are different, uh, certainly in places in Africa you have... Um, Roman law and, and Napoleonic code countries sitting right next to common law countries and not necessarily having interoperable systems, even if you're trying to do the same thing. Um, well, so it's not as bad as that, actually. What's that? No, it's not as bad as that. The civil law and the common law can do the same thing. It's just a question of, of, of managing the codes. I mean, you've got me onto one of my little hobby horses here. <laughs> <laughs> but well, that's me, part of the moderator's yeah, job. But, <laughs> but, but, but let, me, let me say, and you see this, the World Bank has done research. They do, they do a project every year about how the laws in, in countries across the world uh, are either helping or not helping. And particularly when we look at the status of women across the world, you know, that, that latest World Bank study found that there are still 155 countries in the world. And remember, there's only, what, 200 and, I don't know, I can't remember, six or something like that, countries in the world. So that's a hell of a lot of them that don't give women the same legal rights as men. Mm. And including, um, you know, the, the, there's even some places like the UK where we do really well, but then there's one or two things where we don't give women the same legal rights as men, usually in relation to pensions and, and, uh, and, uh, and other things like that. So, you know, there's a lot of work to be done with governments and with global standards, but it's exactly what you're saying. You're talking about global standards, but adapting them locally. And it is, it, it's, it's not true to say that, 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 that this, there's this deep income incompatibility between the civil law and the common law. Uh, it's just that they go about changing their laws and, and adapting their laws in different ways. But that's one of the things this project at the World Bank Well, I'll give really you an example. Uh, last night, uh, yeah. white wine in Ming vases. Yeah. I was talking to somebody who was uh, <laughs> setting up uh, enterprise in Africa. And they are 
incorporated as a for-profit on the ground in Africa and as a not-for-profit back home in the United States. Some of their donors have said, well, I'm not sure what my support is then. Is it being turned into profit somewhere else in the world? There is um, a sort of stay in your lane, uh, let's stay safe and predictable kind of approach that different stakeholders bring to this task. And people who might very comfortably give money to a straight up charity that's doing a straight up charitable thing somewhere in the world might hesitate slightly or at least need to know a lot more before they start to underwrite for-profit businesses elsewhere in the world, when they're not getting uh, the same kind of uh, annual reports and balance sheets that that mother yeah, might Yeah, but with, with respect, that's a different question from saying that there's a fundamental incapacity incompatibility between the civil law and common law. I'm so, sorry, this is getting very geeky and legal. Mm -hmm. But let me, um, let me say that, of course, we need to do more to make sure, and this is where governments come in, and it's where organizations like the G7 or the World Bank come in, and, and I'm also a part of something called the World Justice Project, which brings in common standards. Let, let me give you a different kind of example, India. India, in the last couple of years, has introduced a requirement for Indian registered corporations mm -hmm. to spend, and you've probably all heard of this, 2% of their profits, they, they need to invest in, in, in um, philanthropy. Um, the snag is, speaking as a, as, as, as a, from my point of view, as a, as a foundation that does projects in, in India, is that the Indian companies can't give to any NGOs unless they are Indian mm -hmm. regulated. Um, now, that's, that's fine, but just talking the other day to some, some people there, what's happening is that there are many, many small Indian NGOs who are now finding that it's quite difficult for them, them to absorb the capacity of this, that these extra funds are available, but the companies are trying to invest the funds and are finding that the, the expertise, which actually some of the international organizations have, that needs to help um, the local uh, NGOs absorb this. It, it, it's very difficult to do that because the government rules makes it very difficult for you to give money to, say, Oxfam, for example, to help them in their in their local uh, in, in their local work. Now, that's just an example of. Uh, needing some tweaking, as we were saying, learning from experiences, so that they, you know, getting the Indian government perhaps to slightly change their rules to make sure there's local content without necessarily requiring that all that local content has to be provided by um, local NGOs, but you know, assisting local NGOs. So, you, you know, that's, that's, that's just a, a, a learning experience. We are learning all the time, and it's by talking about it like this and sharing our experiences that things can change. But going back, because I would be remiss if I didn't say this about what are the legal obstacles in the world, do, do you know? that there are 18 countries today in the world where women, where women can be prevented by their husbands from working. And indeed, as we know, there are still too many countries in this world where women can't even travel without permission from a male relative. And in the 21st century, we should be doing a lot more to, to make sure that governments that are joined up to international organizations like um, the um, human rights organizations around the world uh, should be starting to say to, um, to countries that really, this is not acceptable. You know, let me, let me jump in really quick on, just on, on the last point. You know, I, I, it's, it's interesting when I hear about a solution being to tweak the Indian government sort of 2% um, local content rule. You know, I, I spent the past almost six years. I appreciate the, how difficult it is, by the way. <laughs> with the with the Rockefeller Foundation, and 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 now have come back come back to government over in the past uh, almost a uh, little over six months. But what's interesting is so we are mandated to only fund 100% African-owned grassroots enterprises, and 
all the capacity building, all the technical assistance that we link. So we're funding directly African cooperatives. The technical assistance that we provide is not done and cannot be done by an outside US-based or UK-based NGO. Now, my whole career has been in the international development, you know, NGO, uh, World Bank sort of space. And I, I came and I said, wow, that sounds fascinating. That's fantastic. 100% African-owned entities link with local, local support. And, and, and with all due respect, we do often hear, well, the local organizations don't have the capacity to be able to do it. Well, if we don't keep some mandates of our own, they will never have the capacity. You're never going to get an African Oxfam, an African McKinsey, an African TechnoServe, an African-run organization to be able to do it. And we know that while in our minds we talk about working ourselves out of a job, there are very few international NGOs that are really trying to work themselves out of a job. And, and in the past eight months, I have seen my, my um, acumen expand as I really have had to sort of say, what will it take for this African organization to be linked to an African-run non-financial business development, business advisory firm, and how do we make that happen? And sometimes it's not the international NGO being the intermediary, intermediary. it becomes, okay, build their capacity for them to be able to do it. But it's, it's a fascinating pu push and pull on the international donor assistance community, and how do you ever have the critical mass of African, in my perspective, African organizations, not only as the implementers of the programs, but also as the capacity building the technical assistance. If we didn't have to do it, I guarantee you, we would not do it. I, I, listen, I would agree with that. And, um, you know, as you say, it, it is push and pull. Let me give you another example, women-owned businesses. Lots of people now investing in women-owned businesses. This is absolutely fantastic. But what is your definition of a woman-owned mm -hmm. business? And maybe we should be talking about women-led businesses. Because when I talked about women problem, problem that women have having access to capital. So if you're insisting that you only help women-owned businesses if they're 100% or maybe even over 50% owned by women, you come up against a problem that in many countries in the world, it's very difficult for women to get that access to capital. But they could be women led businesses, but because of the way the finance is required, they may be owned uh, not more than 50% by women. Does that mean that these women businesses don't deserve help? So we, this is again about, we need to work out whether the definitions we're adopting with the right intentions, which is to help the development and to help particularly local development or women's development, whether in fact they're really helping or whether in fact they're just putting up these <laughs> negative legal, legal barriers that mean it doesn't actually work. So I think when we think about women-owned businesses, we may be, be better off changing our definition to be women-led businesses. <laughs> How important is what's happening in the country that you're trying to do your work in as far as um, legal system, title, um, access to the courts, the ability to sue, uh, guarantees on property rights, um, that kind of um, part of infrastructure that's almost invisible to us sometimes when we're talking about all the other things that go into operating a profitable business. Yeah, certainly for us, it's fundamental, right? Like at, at the core of what we're trying to do is change corporate law. And if we're walking into a, an environment that is not enabling of a company to both make money and make a difference, that needs to be changed. We need to start with corporate law. And so uh, at the very beginning when we enter a new market is an evaluation of what current law requires of a corporation. And frankly, Surprisingly, in many jurisdictions, it is frankly uh, a liability to not maximize the return to shareholder. Mm -hmm. Literally a liability for the directors and executives not to return as much money as humanly possible to shareholders. And so that, if you're asking me like, how important is that? That's well, you, are you out that of is, the game in a place that, that has that as a requirement? Delaware had that requirement until we changed it. Mm -hmm. Full stop. <laughs> what do you mean? Like, the vast majority of jurisdictions begin with a 
legal framework that requires shareholder primacy. Mm -hmm. That's that is the um, normal approach to how business is structured. And so, for, from the work that we do, Ray, it's, that's everything. Though you need to begin with what are the requirements of business and how are we going to move them to a point where, uh, I love, by the way, I think the 2% is incredibly laudable in India. What about the other 98%? <laughs> like, we gotta talk about the other 98%. And so, it's everything to us in terms of where we begin with law in the jurisdictions in which we work. I could talk a bit about land, if you like. Quickly. Quickly. All I'm gonna <laughs> say is, you know, when I was a law student studying land law, I thought, why are we bothering with all this registered law stuff? It all just, you know. Now I realize, you know, if you don't have registered land uh, and you don't have, so you don't know who owns the land, then it's, it's, it's a real uh, impediment on economic development because so much of, of, again, our women's access to capital, so much of your access to capital depends on your collateral. And so much of the collateral will often be depending on whether you own land or not. And then you discover that there is no land registration. And so it is assumed that the land belongs to the men. Mm -hmm. the, and we, that we know, don't we, isn't it something like 80% of all agricultural work is done by women and like 1% of the agricultural land is owned by women. You know, you, you have to do more to have, to have registered the land and to ensure that, you know, when land is owned by a family, that the wives and the daughters have equal rights to be able to hold and own and transmit that land. And without changing that, you don't even get started. <laughs> Charlotte, is there um, a ladder for women who um, you do business with if they uh, show some, some skill and some talent at running a, a local retail sales point? Is there a next logical step where perhaps they become the rep for an area or a distributor for a district? Or is, is there some path uh, that for talented entrepreneurs to uh, to move ahead in in Coke world. Uh, yes, there is. I mean, the most logical one is if you open a small business as a retailer. We've seen many retailers then um, become bigger suppliers in that area, um, and you know we have wonderful stories of women who are now you know one of the I think the third largest distributor in Nairobi. Um, so huge opportunity to grow but I think a good example would be you know what we do with artisans so a lot of the artisans that we train um, have literally some of them have literally just been living on waste dumps um, and how you even make their life safe to begin with and their waste pickers and help you know working with local NGOs in places like Brazil where you actually help them to form cooperatives you help them to actually collect waste safely and actually be able to earn a living from that in a safe way um, and be able to then um, supply local artisans and, and actually for the artisan work to be able to you know, design items by sharing designers with them who would be local um, to, to make things that they know how to make but make them in a much higher quality way so that they can increase um, the market access they have from a very small area to a broader area locally. What we then have done is um, we've made those available on um, our internal website to 700,000 employees. So they start to get orders um, and they start to learn how to fulfill those orders. And we say to all of our, our, our people, you know, it might take some weeks for this to be fulfilled, but please support them. Please help them build their businesses so they know that they know how to fulfill specific orders. And that really helps them to start to grow their businesses. Then what we have done is we have... Is that charitable or is that a for-profit part of Coca-Cola's operations? No, that is... Um, or, or, we, for when we provide that, it's actually helping them to build their capability still. So, but does Coke get a taste if, if you sell an item no, for $10? All those, no, all those okay. profits go back to the community. Okay. Um, what we've then done is um, some of those, for us, the benefit for us, just to be really clear as a business, is it helps people locally in the community see a value to recycling. So suddenly the communities are cleaner. 
um, people are collecting you know, empty bottles or empty cans in the local community because they see that there's a value to doing that. So not only is it benefiting the community because it's a nicer community to live in, but it also creates value for that local community. So that's the knock-on effect. And for Coca-Cola, by not having your product all over the ground the, yeah, uh, in a neighborhood. Everything we do is recyclable. Actually getting people's behavior to change so it picks it up and recycles it. And you can do that the best way by being motivational about saying there's a value to that. And so it, that's why. It's a circular economy at the end of the day. Be getting your questions ready. We're going to start taking questions momentarily. I'd, I would but be remiss. Let me just, I, will, I just wanted to finish by saying that what we then do is we, for the artisans that can then really produce um, and, and can demonstrate that they're doing that on a regular basis, we then actually sell, take those products and we make them available uh, directly to the consumer through um, our uh, online retail websites as well as World of Coca-Cola shops. So, um, and that obviously is huge then because it gives them a sustainable uh, living. Um, CD earlier, Bart, was talking about how being branded as an American entry into a marketplace is in some places the kiss of death. And I'm wondering if in the places where your agency is at work, either changes in government at the other end change the level of receptivity, or changes, frankly, on the United States end. You mentioned that you've been with the agency for six months. Um, you may have read in the papers they've <laughs> changed um, government in the United States in the past six months. Uh, well, small whether, transition. <laughs> whether that changes the approach from, from Washington's end or the reception on the other end. It's a great, great question, and it definitely was the white elephant, if you will, um, on, on the stage, if, if you will, with sort of government and foreign assistance in one sentence. Um, let me talk about it really quickly from a personal perspective and professionally. So again, six, eight months ago, I take this, take this job. This is a US government agency focused on Africa. i had been focused on Africa with the Rockefeller Foundation and the World Bank and the like. And the job that, the C, that as the CEO and with the board, they hired me, amplify our impact, can increase our partnerships with corporations who, who we manage and monitor a lot of CSR projects. We do local investment. Continue to work with host country governments who co-fund some of our projects because we reach poor and vulnerable populations in places they can't even reach. All this was like grow, grow, grow the impa impact, amplify the impact. November 8th, present day, present day reality. It's the fundamental question now is literally why do we need to exist? In an America first world, why do you need the US African Development Foundation? And, the, and I have spent a lot of time not, work, not meeting with the corporations that I was hired to meet with or not doing a lot of the um, collaboration with philanthropists, but talking to, to members of Congress about local economic development, about peace and security and prosperity being the best offense to the defensive posture that, that we have you know, now in our, in our political climate. And so I personally have lived in northern Nigeria, the home of Boko Haram. I lived in, in East Africa, Al, you know, Al Shabaab. We work in the Great Lakes regions, highly, highly, highly post-conflict and conflict nations. And so to be able to talk to members of Congress who literally are talking about, are you efficient? Are you effective? And what's the return on investment for taxpayer dollars in those places? To be able to say, look, this is a local economic stimulus package. If these local communities, women-led enterprises, agriculture cooperatives, if they are prosperous, if they grow their, in, uh, their revenues, if they create more jobs, these, they're no longer poor and vulnerable looking for alternatives, and those alternatives lead to sort of some choices that we don't like. If we don't do this, if we aren't offensive with our support, for local economic development, for foreign assistance, we're going to be defensive in a way that we can never defend. So, you know, the climate is definitely, definitely a different value proposition. I'd never in 20 years talked to anybody about what's the need for, you know, economic development from U.S foreign assistance in, a, in an African nation. But this is a conversation we're having. But it also is making me go back to the core of what is the return on investment? Why is this important for, for America? And so it's, it's actually cathartic to some extent because these are basically, it's not preaching to the choir, which is what we do at Skoll and, and WEF and the other places. It's like the non-converted. And how do you really fundamentally talk to someone about the importance of economic growth as a driver to peace, security, prosperity, and, and business as part of that solution. And so it's been, it's been a whirlwind, 
in terms of where I was six, eight months ago and where I am now, but it's also been interesting on the other end, to your point. I, I talked to obviously a lot of heads of state and, and, and ambassadors in, in Washington, but to, to be able to have conversations with them around donor assistance and around investing in, the, in, in their countries and in their communities, in these poor and vulnerable communities in their nations, and to be able to say, look, the reality is that I'm getting asked questions about our efficiency, our effectiveness, our return on investment. So you as a nation, are, you know, we have to talk more clearly about your contribution to what we are doing as well. So it literally is having a conversation like a business deal, Charlotte, on like, okay, where is the skin in the game in a big way? In, the, in terms of if we are working in these communities and we have a model for economic development, how are you as a nation looking at the 250,000 grant that we're making to these cooperatives? How are you looking at your own development um, programs and saying we want to replicate that in 30 other places? Because you know, we want to be able to come in and demonstrate success and to be honest, to be able to leave and so that while we help them get on their feet, these businesses, they're running without us. And to now to be able to have to talk to government officials in the nations about the U.S. is making that part of our value proposition now. It's, it's changed the framework. But to be honest, countries like Rwanda, I was literally yesterday talking uh, in, in D.C. with the ambassador to Rwanda. And she said, you know, in our nation, we, are, we don't want aid anymore. We are talking about trade mm -hmm. in, our, in our nation. And so, CD, when you do come, when, when ADF is working with our women's groups and doing things around agriculture, it needs to be not foreign assistance, but an investment. And so we also want those groups to increase their incomes, to create jobs, to grow their revenues. To, to, it's, it's amazing that now these nations are also seeing it as sort of transactional, but for the greater, the greater good. And we're catalytic but we get out of the way and they take over. Questions? Yes, ma'am. You, stand up, tell us who you are. Roberta Baskin, and um, I just would like to double click on what you just said about Rwanda. I just read a, um, and also on what Bono said last night about uh, women's empowerment um, at, at this time, that that's what, what we need. Um, I read a book about Rwanda by uh, Swanee Hunt that's coming out next month called Rwandan Women Rising. And it's about women's leadership in Rwanda, which is now number one in the world, 64% in parliament, and um, also women on the bench and, and um, women in leadership positions throughout government. And I'm wondering about the impact on business in Rwanda, um, trade, not aid. Um, it, what you can say with, from all of your perspectives about um, Rwanda is a happening place and very much based on women's leadership. Thank you. Well, let, let me say about Rwanda, you mentioned the ambassador she. Yes. We exactly. also, <laughs> the high commissioner from Rwanda here is also a woman. Uh -huh. So yeah, they, they're not just, in, just in, in, in the government, the foreign minister's a woman. I was in, I was in Rwanda just, just three weeks ago. I mean, the question is, at this rate, they're gonna have to implement their 66% quota in, on behalf of the men in, 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 <laughs> in, in, in parliament. We, we did, uh, we, we done a fantastic, uh, a program in Rwanda with the help from Accenture, we, we reached 16,000 Rwandan women with a mixture of programs. Some of them we supported with our mentoring platform, some of them working with Care International and their, their savings and loans clubs. Uh, we went into the villages and turned the savings and loans clubs, which at that time were saving in, in, in boxes, and we developed a mobile phone app so that instead of saving in boxes, they were able to save on the mobile phone and, uh, and earn a little interest on that product. We also developed a loan product, which was about 10% less in interest rate than the, the standard um, rate of interest for, for loans in Rwanda, because that's one of the features in Africa, isn't it, that the expense of bank loans is horrendous, you know, 25, 30, 35 percent, you know, no wonder uh, no one wants to take out a, a bank loan, particularly as, and going back to the legal question, where in many of these countries, if you default on a bank loan, uh, you don't just uh, get taken to court in a civil way, but you can actually be sent to prison still for, for debt. So that's another example of where you need to change the laws in order to uh, encourage 
behavior. So what we're seeing in, 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 in Rwanda generally is a development from an agricultural-based economy, which is still very much an agricultural-based economy because, you know, Rwanda initially didn't seem to have any other resources but its, its climate and it, it, its, its produce. Though, in fact, it's now there are minerals there and things being discovered. One of the reasons I think that the minerals are now starting to become of interest to companies is the fact that the government has built the infrastructure, it's built the roads, mm -hmm. it's invested in the, in the IT and in the telecommunications strategy, so that, and it has developed a very, you know, it's, it's gone right up in the ease of doing business index. So, so therefore, it's attracting this investment now as a result of which companies are much more keen, even little things like it's developed five-star hotels, because, you know, let, let's be honest, many businesses who are traveling to, to countries for development would prefer to have a comfortable hotel. I mean, it may sound trivial, but all these things matter. So I think Rwanda is a great example of how political leadership um, has, has driven uh, that country from, from the depths of despair over genocide to um, one of the biggest growing uh, economies, you know, relatively from, from where it starts in, in, in Africa. Let's go to the first row here. Get a mic over there. Uh, thank you. My name is Joseph Walgembe from Uganda. I'll put in two quick questions. Uh, on the first one, forgive my naivety about international relations, but I love all the values you are trying to propel uh, in business, but what's your reflection on the business um, environment in Uganda that is in, in Africa or in some African countries that is being dominated by quote unquote China, who clearly are not talking to our government cinema about human rights and they seem to be the darling on, on, on the block because they don't talk about all these issues you talk about that make the majority <laughs> men in our governments uncomfortable. And uh, secondly, yesterday I was running a workshop and I was talking of how to incentivize business to think about people who could be initially considered probably less productive, less business-wise viable, to be supported to participate in uh, all the benefits that business bring, like people with disabilities. I'd like to hear about your take on that, especially when you talk about extremely poor women, who could include poor women with disabilities at the bottom of that category. Thank you. Let's take the second one first. Uh, creation of capacity, training, so on. If, um, I think one of the reasons that it's important for us to, why we don't do the training on our own, we do it with other people, is to really make sure that when you're dealing with um, the bottom of the pyramid, some of the, some of the poorest um, uh, women who don't have access to so many of the things that we want to give them access to, um, is that you, you bring other people to the table. We talk about it as the golden triangle. You know, you bring government, you bring... Um, civil society, you bring NGOs, you bring other businesses to try and find the collective uh, and unique set of skills and experiences that will actually develop the programs that are relevant. So um, we don't know all of the things. We might be on the ground and we might have great access um, and understanding of the local culture and community, but we may not know everything there is to know. So we obviously work with other partners that bring a deeper understanding sometimes of the you know, unintended consequences of some of the programs um, to make sure that all of that is built in. So I'm not sure if that answers your question, but that's the way I would think about it. And on China, Africa is um, sort of the proving ground for, uh, there's, a, there's a competition of different visions of how to do development. Right now, uh, China's approach toward resource extraction uh, skills transfer, technology transfer, control of land is a very different proposition from what you've been talking about on the panel tonight, uh, th this morning, and Africa is going to be given a stark choice. Well, no, they already are asking questions about that, I think, in Africa, and I think China is already starting to see that possibly going into a, a country, extracting it, it, its minerals and bringing it 
all the labour, you know, even the cooks and the cleaners uh, are all imported is possibly not the best best way to win win friends and, and, and influence people. I mean, we see it, we see it, don't we? Um, now, and it's what what you're you're doing in 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 your work is that companies are much more aware these days of uh, the their need to be good corporate citizens and to engage with the local community so that they don't just seem to come in as, as vultures who swoop down, take out the, the, the riches of, of the country and don't give anything back. That is not the approach of many, many mining companies these days, for example. Many of the big mining companies are very, very aware of how they need to engage with, with the local uh, community. Um, What's interesting to me as someone who now does a lot of these trade arbitration disputes is whether we're seeing it transmitting from the lawyers who are advising the com companies from a corporate social responsibility time to the lawyers who are advising the companies at the end when these contracts go wrong about suing governments who are trying to put in some kind of social responsibilities. And I think we're going to be seeing We've seen this revulsion, if you like, going around, which has reflected T TPP and TTIP, the international trade agreements between the EU and the US, for example. Um, and the arbitration community itself is now talking about how you redesign international trade arbitrations to take into account the legitimate desire of governments to ensure that it protects the environment, the, 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 the social structure um, of, of of a country. So uh, going back to again, lawyers are starting to think a bit more creatively about, about these things uh, too. And we, I think we're going to see a lot more movement in this space. And it, it's very much linked into the sort of work that, that you're doing and, and the sort of work that Coca-Cola is doing, because Coca-Cola absolutely understands that they, they need to be a good global citizen uh, because if you are a good global citizen, people want to buy your products, people want to work for you, and investors, smart investors, reckon that you're gonna, your share price is going to carry on going up and not suddenly be <coughs> plunged down by some scandal. Because these days we're only a mobile phone away, aren't we, from a picture that no one wants to see. Well, yeah. I, I just wanted to pick up on what Tris is uh, referring to here. It, one of the, the challenges that we all need to overcome is the belief that this engagement in these critical issues is concessionary. Mm -hmm. That by engaging in uh, involving your, your organization and your local community, building capacity, uh, creating high quality jobs, having a, uh, a conscientious approach to the environment, those aren't costs, those are opportunities. Right. And the data is, is becoming overwhelming that over the long haul, it builds a more resilient business. I think Coke could speak to this absolutely directly, that if you look over any significant period of time, higher standards of environmental, social, and governance practices leads to higher returns for shareholders and more resilience. And I can say for our community, the certified B Corp community during the financial downturn, they were 64% more likely to survive the financial downturn. It, I couldn't agree more, Shri. It, this isn't an expense base. It's an opportunity to build resilience in your corporations. Um, we're pretty close to the end of our time. If someone's got a quick question that can be answered quickly, uh, <laughs> that, that might help us get off on time. Uh, sir, you had your hand up. Well, it really is quick. I'm Edward Millard from Rainforest Alliance. And, uh, you know, to that last point, yes, but we're not there yet. And as we have a journalist moderating this panel, I just wanted to give a shout for the really, really important role that journalism media has to play still in being one of these <laughs> one of the agents for change because business is more informed, more aware, but statistics tell us that they're not all actually there where we want them to be. And you guys often name and shame them and that's a really important part of this moving business behavior. It wasn't a question, but since you said nice things about journalists, <laughs> we'll, uh, we'll end it there. Thank you very much for coming. Thank our panelists, please. <laughs>